Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. And welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. Whew, we are in the thick of the holiday season, aren't we? It is just flying by. I can't believe that we are less than two weeks from the end of this year and about to start another year. Um, I hope you're doing well. Hope that whatever holidays you're celebrating, you are enjoying them, not putting too much stress uh, on yourself, as sometimes happens this time of year. I mentioned the last episode, I think, uh, I think I mentioned it, that my husband and some friends and I were going to go to a Christmas market uh, over the weekend, and this was in our little our little village here in Portugal. It was my very first European Christmas market. I was so excited. And they they have these little huts that instead of just like booths that I would think of in, um, I mean, I've been to like Christmas craft fairs, Christmas bazaars, those sorts of things. So it's kind of like that, but outside and each, instead of like a table, you get this little, this adorable little hut for lack of a better word. Those of you who have been to them, you're probably rolling your eyes at me right now for my very poor descriptions, but I mean, if you just look up pictures of a European Christmas market, you'll see these these little huts, cabins, caves. Caves? Where did that come from? Um, anyway, wooden structures that the people have their food or their crafts. Um, there was somebody that crocheted really adorable amigurumi um, that I loved, of course. And we ate and walked around. It was 62 degrees, so I was wearing a short sleeve shirt. And my husband bought us all Christmas beanies that lit up, and we all wore them and looked like total dorks. Loved it. Santa and his elf came out at one point and danced to Mariah Carey, All I Want for Christmas. And then a Portuguese song that I did not recognize um because i haven't lived here long enough yet and then a song that our south african friends were very excited about um that they knew and um our one friend went out and danced with santa and the elves and a bunch of other people because it's a line dance and so yeah i think a good time was had by all i told my husband and i'm really glad we started with the christmas market in our village because you know there was maybe 20 booths at most and it's very small but very cute very quaint and i think if we'd started somewhere like I don't know, Vienna or somewhere in France or somewhere in Norway uh, or or something like that where they're really big and and I might not have appreciated our little village Christmas market as much as I do because it was my first one. So now I can now I can just branch out and go find other ones and go exploring, which I can't wait to do. But um, yeah, that was our experience. And we're going to do it again. And we're, I, well, I'm going to go find other ones next year in different towns, different countries, whatever. I'm sure you'll hear about it in a year <laughs> if you're still listening to the podcast. So uh, speaking of the podcast and why you probably are listening not to hear about my European Christmas market experience, um, you're here for the books and the authors. And I have both, of course, this episode. I am speaking with author... Kim Hayes about her novel Pesticide and this was fun for a lot of reasons but um, the first reason is that she lives in Switzerland so she was almost in the same time zone since we moved I have not been speaking with people in similar time zones as often it it does happen more than I expected it to but she lives in Switzerland which was an hour ahead of me and so of course um, either before or after the interview I don't remember which I asked her about (laughs) Christmas in Switzerland and Christmas markets. See, it all comes back to my personal interest in Christmas markets. But um, yeah, we had a we had a very fun conversation, uh, and we did talk about the book in addition to me asking her impertinent questions about Christmas. So let me go ahead and give you the description uh, from the back of the book. 
Bern, Switzerland, known for its narrow cobblestone streets, decorative fountains, and striking towers. Yet dark currents run through this charming medieval city and beyond to the idyllic farmlands that surround it. When a rave on a hot summer night erupts into violent riots, a young man is found the next morning bludgeoned to death with a policeman's club. Seasoned detective Juliana Linder is assigned to the case. That same day, an elderly organic farmer turns up dead and drenched with pesticide. Enter Juliana's younger and distractingly attractive colleague Renzo Donatelli to investigate the second murder. Juliana's disappointment that they're on two different cases is tinged with relief. Her home life is complicated enough without the risk of a fling. But when an unexpected discovery ties the two two victims into a single case, Juliana and Renzo are thrown to get closer together than ever before. Dangerously close. Will Juliana be able to handle the threats to her marriage and to her assumptions about the police? If she wants to prevent another murder, she'll have to put her life on the line and her principles. So that is the description of Pesticide. When I um, first started reading this and before everything kind of came out in the story, I thought this is a very strange title for what I am reading initially. It's the second murder that brings in the pesticide, as you heard in the description. And I never read the, the descriptions before I read the book. For When I'm finding a book for myself to read, I always do. But for the podcast, I never do. I just jump right in. I don't know why that is. But anyway, pesticide made total sense once I actually got into the story. And for you, there's no mystery because I read you the back of the book if you didn't skip ahead. At any rate, um, this is suspense. It's a mystery. It's a bit of a thriller. I really like Juliana as one of the main characters. She is in her 40s. She is attracted to a man who is about 12 years younger than her, and none of this is shocking, but it it isn't always the combination that you see in books, um, especially when there is, are romantic over or undertones in those books. So for me, as um, also a woman in her 40s, it's just nice to read a book that has a main character that I identify with. And I can identify with women in their 20s and 30s and remember what those decades were like as well. But it is nice to see myself sometimes in books. And it's not like I don't get a lot of representation in books. But age-wise, it is nicer to see someone closer to my own age. So enough on that. I'm going to let you listen to the interview so you can hear Kim talk about the book. Um, Again, the book is called Pesticide. The author is Kim Hayes. Let's go ahead and get to that interview. Hi, Kim. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure. I'm very happy to have you here um, to talk about your novel, Pesticide. But before we do that, if, um, if you could share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you a bit, that would be wonderful. Okay. Well, I think The most important thing about me right now is that I live in Bern in Switzerland. And that is why my book, this book, and it's part of the series. So the series is set in Bern in Switzerland. Um, I, 34 years ago, I married a Swiss and he and I have lived here ever since. Bern is his hometown. Um, We have a son and both I and my son are double citizens. So I'm both a Swiss and an American, although I'm always an American inside me just because that's where I was raised. Um, I've also lived some other interesting places. I've lived, I lived actually most of my schooling I did in San Juan in Puerto Rico. And then I did my last two years of high school in Vancouver. So I've lived in Canada and um, I'm lucky. I've lived in some beautiful places. And then I've also um, spent a year after college living in Stockholm. Um, It's interesting that those are three places, plus Boston, where I lived a lot in the States, and Berkeley, where I did graduate work, they're all on the ocean. (laughs) And now I live in Switzerland, which has beautiful mountains and is completely landlocked. So I tanked up, filled up on the ocean in my youth. And now I have to go quite far away to see the ocean. Yes, so that's absolutely. a start, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I love it. You're very international. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I grew up in the mountains, and then I, I also lived in Berkeley for graduate work, um, and I've lived, I live 
as you know, in the south of Portugal. So I did the opposite. I grew up in mountains. And then lately, I've been living more on the coast um, near the ocean. Enjoying the enjoying the waves. Yes. That must be yes. very nice. Now, you mentioned that you live in Bern and the books are set in Bern. And the foreword of the book, I found very interesting and helpful. You talk about the language that is spoken in this particular area where your book is set. Can you talk a little bit about that? Of course, um, we, I, I, and, tr- and stop me if I get too complicated, because I find this very interesting. But it turns out um, that not only does Switzerland have four official languages, um, uh, which are French, Italian, a language no one ever has ever heard of called Oreto Romanish, which is like Latin, and German. But in fact, it isn't German. So although 65, officially on paper, 65% of the people in Switzerland speak German, um, it is actually an unwritten, what they actually speak is an unwritten language called Schweizerdeutsch or Swiss German. And each area has its own dialect. So uh, I live in Bern and the people in Bern, which in Bernese dialect is called Bad, the people here, um, speak a form of German that most Germans can't understand. Um, I have learned to speak it, but it has taken me a long time. <laughs> and I do sometimes mix it with high, with the German of Germany. Um, this dialect isn't a written language and it's pronounced the vowel there. It has its own words um, that don't exist in, in high German or German German but it also has very different pronunciations. So um, I think when we think dialect, we tend to think Americans. We don't really have, we have very few dialects, if any, in the States. We have accents. But these, this is really, as I said, as different. I would say Bernese uh, German is as different from the German, official German that's written down as, say, Norwegian is from Swedish. So it could just as easily be considered another language. Yes. And actually, I was having a a conversation about this last night because I was um, in a group of people, uh, several of whom were German, and then one person who grew up in South Africa, but his family has German heritage somewhere, but his uh, his mother now lives in Vienna and and he lives in Portugal. So he's very multicultural, but um, national. Yes, uh, but we we were talking about this. I was telling them about the foreword of your book, and it sparked this whole conversation about other German dialects and other little areas mm-hmm. where there's pockets of German that are very different. If you tried to understand them, and and you spoke, you know, maybe you've learned German as a second language, you probably wouldn't understand them. Yes, and this I also have learned as I've lived in Europe. It's just something we don't think about in the United States. I think most people that a person who lives in Sicily. When they, they, and a person who lives in Venice, if they have to speak written Italian to understand each other, but their actual, the actual thing that they speak every day, the dialects of Venice and Sicily, say Palermo, are so different that they could not understand each other. So this is true all over Europe, that people yeah. in different regions speak a very different form of the language. And and you were worried that you would get too technical, but uh, we could spend a whole hour talking about this. I'd be happy because I I find it fascinating, but we we should get to the book, right? (laughs) Yes, we should talk about the book because you worked hard on it and we would like to promote it. And yes, I do want to promote it and talk about it, but um, it's already time for the first break of the podcast. (laughs) So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with author Kim Hayes about her book, Pesticide, and we are finally going to get to the overview of that book. So give an overview of the story, please. Ah, gladly. Okay. Um, Well, it's, I don't want to tell too much because it's a mystery. So of course it's full. I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but it starts, it's a murder mystery with two police detectives who belong to the Canton Police of Bern. And in fact, a series, and this book is the first in a series, Pesticide is the first, is called Polizei Bern, or the Bern, Bern Police series. Um, in the book, Pesticide begins with two murders, one um, that take, as a young man in his 20s that's killed during a riot, and the other body that's found the same weekend um, is uh, 20 miles away, an an old man, a man over 70, killed on his farm. And his body, the farmer's body, has been sprayed with pesticide. There seems to be no connection between these two dead men. um, And two different detectives who, who have worked together are assigned to one to each case. And it won't be very surprising for readers to hear, this is not a spoiler, that it turns out that these cases are connected. And so um, as the book progresses, of course, the two detectives have to solve the mystery of uh, who killed these these two men. Yes. And one thing that I found fascinating as I was reading was, um, you know, I've, I've read a lot of American mysteries set in America, and I've read a lot of mysteries set in England. Um, and so I kind of feel like I understand a little bit about those, th- those processes and how the police work and how investigations happen. But this was a completely different setting for me. So did you have to do a lot of research about the way the police work and you know, just how everything works in terms of investigating a homicide in, in Bern and in Switzerland? Yes, I did do a lot of research. Um, and I was I mean, some of it was reading, you know, just understanding the system better. Um, The court system is also different. So how how, um, you know, someone is is judged when if they are accused of a crime is different here. Um, But yes, I'm very lucky that I have a policewoman um, as a neighbor. She is not, um, you know, she's as nice as my and interesting as my detective, but not at all similar to her. but it has been very helpful for me to be able to ask her questions. And I've also you know, visited the Bern police station, talked to um, other police, and I've t- talked quite a bit to um, district attorneys, people who you know, obviously work on the cases. They're also helpful when you need to know more about a whole new police system that um, you don't, you know, you can't just say if you're, I'm sure there are mystery writers that, that, I'm sure they all do good research, but, you know, they occasionally think, I can't assume anything is what I'm trying to say. I can't think about any detective story I've seen on TV, whether it's British or American, and say, oh, I know how they do that from TV or from reading. No, I don't. I really have to check it because it is different here. Yeah, I was I was fascinated by that. I thought I, it, it was really interesting to read um, about a different process and just, to, you know, when you hit those points and you go, oh, yeah, OK, that's different than what I was expecting to happen. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm glad I'm glad it's interesting. Of course, I don't want to make it a challenge. The, the purpose of the book is to entertain. But I think, right. you know, I hope that's part of the entertainment. Yeah. And yeah. And I, I'm always fascinated by research with with authors because you have to do so much research, but you can only put a very small percentage of that into the actual story because you don't want to bog readers down um, yes. So to find that balance between explaining and over explaining. Yes, that was very much true for me with organic farming. I would say that, you know, what inspired me um, when I thought about what was most I would, although obviously I wanted to write a mystery, when I thought about a theme, I'm so interested, I've never been a farmer, um, but I was so interested in learning more about organic farming and why is it different from regular farming and what kind of work is involved. And in a sense, you could say, what is the point of it? I mean, we know it's good for the environment, but what does that exactly mean? And so I got, I learned so much about organic farming. And then as you say, I had to be very careful 
the famous phrase for writers is when they say, oh, this is so boring, it's only an information dump. That's the phrase that often is used by critics is, oh, you know, this isn't interesting. And I feel from, you know, criti- from good, good reviews that I've had that I didn't do that. But you're right, it's very difficult to put in just the right amount of information. And of course, every reader is different. Some people are fascinated to learn about organic farming and some people wish there wasn't as much as there was. So you never yeah. know, but you try. Yeah, absolutely. Can you talk a little bit more about the two detectives, uh, Juliana and Renzo? What about each of them do you think is going to resonate with readers? Well, I am extremely fond of both of them. This is something that happens when you create characters um, and you think about them a lot. Um, But even before they took shape um, in my mind, I was very sure that I wanted to to have detectives and I did want to have two um, because it makes it more fun to give two different perspectives on things. Um, uh, I want them to not be loners. I read, I read many, many mysteries and I love mysteries, you know, and I love mysteries that have, that feature loner detectives who have, for whatever reason live on their own. Sometimes they also have al- problems with alcohol or drugs or they're, they're different in some way. I, I have nothing against this, but I really wanted to um, create two people with very real lives. Um, I mean, being lonely can be a real life as well, of course, but I mean, who had a family, who had spouses, who had kids, who had the problem of having to balance a very demanding job, which policing is, with trying to live a, a family, a normal family life. And um, because I think that not just police, but, you know, most of us have this problem. And I think that um, if if you create a police person, male or female, who does it, who's just on their own, um, it's too easy for them. (laughs) The reality is you're constantly balancing. So but but that's that's kind of a, a, a philosophical thing. What I think is nice about Juliana and Renzo is that um, they're I tried to make them both tough in a way as a police man or woman has to be and vulnerable. And one of the ways they're vulnerable as readers will quickly find is that they are in love with each other and yet they are at least very attracted to each other and very interested in each other and very fond of each other also as friends, they work together a lot. And um, the woman detective Juliana is about, is 12 years older than Renzo, than the man. So he's in his mid thirties, she's in her mid to late forties. Um, and they, this is really a problem for them because they are very much embedded in their families. So they have a dilemma. And so besides having to, to solve their, solve the mysteries in the books, they have to work out how to cope with their feelings about each other. And um, I will take a side note to say that I love that you made Juliana a a little older than Renzo and also not the kind of often when you read books, the main characters, especially female characters, they seem to be 27, 28, right in that age. Um, So I love made her a little older. She has a teenager and a 10 year old. She's a little older than Renzo. It's just a nice representation for women who may not see themselves in middle age in a lot of their favorite books. Yes, I mean, she really, and yet, you know, obviously she's attractive and interesting and smart and all, and, and, and I wanted to make her um, very secure. I mean, she has problems and like all of us, she has, she has her, her inner demons or whatever, but, you know, she's not um, worrying about her weight or something, you know, she's just there and she's, she's um, secure about herself. And I, that was important to me. And another thing about Renzo that I wanted to mention because we were talking about different cultures is Renzo's parents are Italian. So, and they came to Switzerland as many, many Italians did in the fifties to to work at factory jobs and jobs that um, the Swiss needed them as, as a work workforce. And so he's born and grown up in Switzerland, but he still has many thinks of himself as an Italian in many ways. And because he has a lot of Italian qualities, he allows me to comment on the Swiss. So there are no Americans in 
in, so far I've written, you know, I've written more than the first book and there are no Americans, um, but it, Arenzo as a non-Swiss at heart is allowed to comment occasionally on when Swiss do things that he thinks are strange. <laughs> so yes. he gives me a cultural and outside of the culture, uh, the Swiss culture, he gives me a new perspective, which I really you know, enjoy working with. Yes, because as um, a person who moved there in, later in your life, you would have some of those same perspectives of this is different than what I am expecting. Exactly. It may not be bad or good, but, you know, it allows right. it, it, it allows you not to, he does not take everything that the Swiss do for granted. Yes. You know, as I do. Let's go ahead and take the second break of this episode. When we come back, Kim will be talking about character v- character development. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Kim Hayes. When it comes to your characters, then, do you have a really good picture of them before you start writing, or do you like to let them evolve as you write, or is it a combination? It's, you know, it's such an interesting question for all writers, I think. How, how, do, they, uh, how do their characters develop? Um, and I think that... I will say something that probably you've heard many people say. There's a there's something, there's a point in writing which doesn't happen all the time, that when you're writing and your writing starts to flow, you and, and flow can exist in any kind of work. I'm sure you know you you can you can have flow when you're doing something totally uh, different, that you just feel your work is going well, you can you, you're just into it, you're not distracted. But in writing, this is very important. And so when it's flowing, your characters seem to just um, speak for themselves. You know, it's not magic. It's not. It's nothing mystical. But you're so um, you're so embedded, I think, in their world and in what's happening to them that they just develop themselves. Of course, it's coming out of your brain, but you don't. So to answer your question and not be so long winded, they. I don't really think, I think about what kind of, before I started, I thought about, you know, the older woman, the younger man, and he's very handsome, and that could actually be a problem for him in his work. Sometimes people think he must be gay, other times people, you know, are embarrassed by it, and some of his male colleagues think it's weird, and, uh, and all kinds of things that I thought of beforehand, but then how they actually behave often is not something that I can decide before I'm actually writing. And I'm sure you've heard this before, by the way, haven't you? I have, yeah. Characters often surprise the authors. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which I just, I, I love those stories because you don't think of a character that you are creating and have created. It, it, you wouldn't think it would surprise you, but I hear it all the time. Yes, yes. Well, of course, sometimes you, you the plot demands you to do something. Like, you know, at one point in Pesticide, I for the, th- the plot to work out later on, I really need for Renzo not to have his cell phone with him. Because of course, you know, cell phones spoil a lot of um, 
suspense when people have their cell phone and it's they you know why don't they call for backup or why right. doesn't you know so you off you have these moments where you have to and that makes me have to then um in this particular case i have him get um kind of drunk um he's taken painkillers and he's had he has a little bit too much to drink on top of the painkillers and this you know i'm not give, this is something i'm giving away but you know it doesn't matter right now and and he and he forgets to get his phone out of the car and i think this could happen to anyone but of course me creating this whole picture of something happening to him is based on plot so sometimes you can't just be creative you know you when you're writing a mystery you have to think about how each step is actually going to happen and that sometimes influences what your character is going to do and say uh, yeah i would imagine um speaking of mysteries and writing mysteries what do you think uh about this genre draws you to write within it ah so why mysteries um well i my mother loved mysteries and she read lots of them and i so for me you know it seemed normal for people to read mysteries and by the way i do read lots of other things myself i mean i read I like I'm, I'm, I like science fiction. I like romances. I like uh, fantasy, and I like literary fiction. You know, just plain novels, um, and you know, some nonfiction too. So, but I love mysteries because. So I think because I read mysteries as a child, and then you know Nancy Drew, not and Sherlock Holmes, and then I started to develop more and more interest in different mystery writers. Um, I think. You know, it was partially because I liked, just liked, I think you might as well write what you, what you like, um, what you read. But I also think that I, I like uh, books that are fast, you know, that are entertaining, where um, that don't, um, you know, that where the character, where there's a puzzle, you know, where people are trying to solve a puzzle. But I also like the aspect of mysteries that involves right and wrong you know so i think many people who read mysteries must feel this way that there's something very nice about the way at the end of a mystery um there's a resolution i mean there are mysteries written where the killer gets away or the detective is killed i mean the hero you know there are mysteries of where all kinds of other things happen besides the triumph of good over evil but generally um the, the good guys win at the end of a mystery. And I am, let's say, childish enough um, to like that. And I think many of us do. I don't know, do you feel that way? Oh yeah, I don't necessarily think it's childish. I just like sometimes when um, I'm reading, I want to know that things are going to work out. <laughs> so I have certain authors or certain genres that I read because I know it's either gonna have a happy ending or the mystery will be solved or you know there will be resolution and it's not like, real life where you don't always get resolution. Exactly. I mean, exactly the point, you know, real life gives us enough situations without a resolution or with a sad ending. So yes. we might as well, we might as well escape into books that give us more of a, of a, of a satisfying end. I completely agree. <laughs> um, I know you have uh, the second one. The second one's coming out in, I mean, excuse me, in 2023 for this series, correct? That is right. The second one is not only written, it's already it has a cover. It can be pre-ordered um, and it's called Sons and Brothers and it's coming out in April. And um, I'm, I'm really, really pleased with it. Um, I don't know if you want me to tell any, should I tell something about it or? Yeah, if you can give, um, give what information you can that doesn't uh, spoil anything in the first one. I know that's always a challenge, but. I know, I know. Well, um, this book, it, you know, the book starts out with a, a man has drowned in the Are, which is the river that surrounds Bern and is very much, you know, as what the Mississippi must be to New Orleans. Um, the Are, it's not as big as the Mississippi, but our river is to us, you know, a city that has a river in it and the river basically circles around it, it's never very far from this river. And so um, the book, the cover has a river on it and that is not, not for no reason. Um, a man drowns in the Are 
out walking his dog. And it turns out um, when they find the body that he um, has been, um, he's been punched and he's been possibly held, uh, you know, not tied up. It's, it's clear that he's been in some sort of fight before he was, before he drowned. And it's the last person that you would think that would happen to. He's over 70. He's a cardiac surgeon. He's from an aristocratic family. Um, and and you, there, the, it starts with every with our detectives, our beloved Juliana and Renzo, um, need to figure out what happened to this man. It's clear that it looks very much like someone killed him. And um, they start to talk to his family and friends and find out more and more about his life and his family. And it, the, the more they research, the more it appears that one of his um, one of his three sons may have been involved in his death. Um, and I'll stop there, except to say that another something that comes out in this book, as I you know put organic farming into pesticide as a kind of background, the background in this book. Um, which I uh, very much enjoyed researching, but it's, it's something sad, is that for almost 200 years in Switzerland, um, it was common for children to be, as sometimes as young as seven, eight, or nine, to be contract taken away from their families and contracted out to farmers to work. Um, they were taken away if it was perceived that, they, or they, they had, say, a single mother, um, they were uh, poor families. Sometimes parents actually gave their children into the system because they felt they couldn't take care of them. And they ended up on farms very often um, in, under in very bad conditions. Um, and sometimes obviously there was physical abuse, sexual abuse, and, and, and certainly they were worked, uh, and worked very, very hard. And this went on into the 1970s. So we're not talking about, you know, it's easy for us to imagine something like this in many happening in many countries, including even the United States and certainly the kids being put out to work. But this is something that continued until so recently in Switzerland that it's quite shocking. Um, and it was it was actually officials, local officials who would decide that a mom, especially, as I said, a mother with illegitimate children or the father had just had died or had left the family. She can't raise these kids. They're getting in trouble at school. We just take them away and put them on farms to work or in orphanages, but many of them were put to work. So that's, it exists. This situation is shown in this book. And I think it's quite an interesting one. Yeah, wow, that's fascinating. Um, in terms of the series, do you have a, an arc in mind or are you going to write stories and as long as they come to you? How many books do you envision for the series? Well, it's a good question and I don't know the answer. So all I can do is have fun speculating. I've written the third book. It's done. Um, I'm working on the fourth book. So I think, and, and I'm coming along well, so I think I can guarantee four books. Um, I mean, assuming my publisher wants them, I would like to write a fifth book, but I can't say that I see myself, you know, there are mystery writers who've written 20 and 30 books in a series, and I don't see myself going that far. <laughs> so we'll see. But I think, you know, to the point of five or six, let's let's say that. That's that's something I think I can I can't promise, but I feel pretty good about saying. That's so I, I, people invest, if people invest themselves emotionally a little bit, they will get some more books out of this. All right. That's fair. So in terms of writing, um, when did you start writing? Is it something that you always wanted to do or did you decide to write for publication later in life? How did that work for you? I always enjoyed writing and I wrote for I wrote because I, I got a PhD. So I wrote a PhD dissertation. And of course, I wrote in, in high school and college and my master's and all of that. So I did um, academic writing and I um, had jobs where I did 
uh, freelance articles. I wrote funding proposals for nonprofit organizations and press releases. So I had, I could go on, you know, I had a number of jobs that involved writing, but I just didn't um, start writing a novel or short stories. And I think it was because I was afraid. I somehow didn't, I, I guess I thought it was something that wasn't like I was dying to do it, but it was something that I imagined doing and then was afraid I wouldn't be able to do. So there was a kind of um, nervousness there. Like if I start and I can't do it, I'll be disappointed in myself. I think I felt that way. I've thought about this since. That's what I've come up with. But when my son um, went off to college, um, I had a job then, but I still thought, you know, if I am going to write a novel, this is it, you know, now or never. <laughs> I, I think this is the moment. And I, and I talked to my husband because it meant cutting back. And then eventually I stopped doing the cross-cultural training work that I was doing then. And he was fine with it. Um, so that I think is an important thing to say is when you when you decide to start writing, it isn't just an emotional decision. Sometimes it's a financial decision because it's going to take a lot of your time, or it might, you know, unless you can do it a half an hour a day. So so that was when I started to was and this was actually um, twenty twelve. So this was a long well, it was basically ten years ago that I decided to start to write. Um, and, and, and it, you know, it, it worked. I mean, it didn't just, but it wasn't easy. So, I mean, that's, um, it, it took me then, I think this is something, you know, I don't know if this is something you want to pursue, but I think it's important for people who are listening, who might be interested in ever becoming a writer from the time I finished the first mystery until I got pesticide accepted by a publisher, then it takes time to have a book prepared. It was six and a half years. I did not find a pub anyone to publish the book for six and a half years. And that is a long time. <laughs> yes, it is. That is a long time. And that is patience and commitment and all kinds of good qualities. Let's go ahead and take the final break of this episode. And we'll be continuing this conversation when we come back. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. And I will be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with author Kim Hayes. Before the break, she was talking about writing, publishing, etc., and that this particular book took six and a half years to get published. Um, and so we are picking up with that conversation, and let's get back to the interview. Yeah, and that's that's actually that's good for people to know. It, traditional publishing takes longer, I think, than people realize sometimes. I'm sure that there are people who write brilliant books, they send it out to five agents, you know, one agent loves it, and then that's it. You know, this does happen. I'm sure it does to people. Um, but it's not, it's very much the exception. And I do know a lot of people who, who worked very hard before they got published. And also, I know people who have self-published because they didn't find a publisher. And, and in many cases, they're quite happy about that. And their books have have sold. Um, I think that um, 
this is, you know, it's something to that. What happened to me was when my first book, I couldn't get anyone to, to be interested in the first book. I wrote a second one. And eventually, before I even had had found a publisher for that one, I started the third one. So, uh, you know, some of it is you, you have to like to write, because otherwise, and I think, as I said, you have to have the time and be able to afford to write. I kept on going. And in the end, Pesticide is actually not the first book I wrote. It's the second book I wrote. Um, and the second book I wrote, I worked on more, and it is now, I mean, the first book I wrote is now going to be the second. Sorry, I'm mixing this up. But they got, they, they exchanged places. <laughs> but it took a lot of editing. I think that's another thing people may not realize is that, you know, you're, you write a book and then you write it again and again until you get it right. It's very time consuming. Yes. And you may find yourself um, a little sick of it at the, by the time you're done writing it or editing it. Yes. 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 Well, both. And I also think, you know, that it's very easy to get discouraged and it's yeah. nothing to be ashamed of. I think all writers get discouraged. Um, it, I think, you know, people have in films, people show writers with writer's block and there is writer's block. But I think more it's just the discouragement of, you know, of, of writing and writing and coming back and writing it better. And I, I, it's, 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 it's a hard job. But it's fun. Otherwise, don't, I mean, it's fun. And that's why people do it. If they didn't find it fun, they certainly don't do it to earn money. I can tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. When you take time to read for yourself, you mentioned, you know, you do read in a variety of genres, but what are your go-to authors when you're reading for yourself? I, I do read a lot of mysteries and I am a great fan of, for example, because I write police procedurals, who knows what came first, the chicken or the egg, but I write police procedurals and I love to read police procedurals. And I think Michael Connolly, who is, you know, the father, quote unquote, of Harry Bosch and Mickey Haller, and now who's the Lincoln lawyer, and now he has a woman detective, Renee Ballard, that he's, that he's using. Um, he is brilliant. He is really, a, you know, as far as American police procedural writers go, I guess he's, he's probably, you know, at the top. And, and it's not just that he's very well known. He's also very, very good. Um, and then when it comes, I like a lot of English writers, um, but I, I want his ta as Tana or Tana, not how she, T-A-N-A -A French, Tana French and Cleves. They both have police detectives. Um, and yeah, uh, Deborah Crombie is an author, is a mystery writer. I really like Julia Spencer Fleming. These are Americans. Louise Penny is Canadian. I think a lot of people read her books. And I think now she just has a series, a new, for, for a brand new series on TV. So I'm only mentioning mystery writers, but um, I do read a lot of them. <laughs> well, it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I know you have a website, so if you can share the website along with any social media that you are active on. Well, I use um, as my kind of um, social media name, I use written as one word, Kim Hayes Burn or Bern. And so it's, and Hayes is spelled without an E. That's important because it's always, I mean, it's not the normal spelling. So Kim Hayes Burn. So www.kimhaysburn.com is my, is my website. And then my Twitter and my Facebook accounts are also under, um, I mean, I, I, would you like me to spell it out or am I, is this good enough? No, I saying? think it's probably good. I, I think that's good enough. Kim Hayes, B-E-R-N is Burn. Um, and that's, that. I think people can find me if they would enter that into Google, they would come up with some uh, of my social media. I post, I have a blog and I post about twice a month on something to do with either Switzerland or mysteries or burn itself, or sometimes just something that's in my mind. <laughs> but So it just depends what's, but, but usually it's something to do with Switzerland and something, some issue that's um, to do with my books as well. All right. Thank you. 
Well, Kim, we have talked about a variety of different things during our time together, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to highlight? Well, I think I did say this, but I, I've talked a lot about um, my mysteries. In, um, I'm going to use the plural since the second one will be out in a few months um, and the series in terms of, you know, the background information and the and, and sort of morality, right and wrong. But what's really most important for me um, is that they should be a lot of fun to read, that they should be entertaining, that they should be exciting, that they should, um, that people should like the characters. And um, I've gotten uh, enough feedback from readers and also from reviewers that I feel good that they really are entertaining and, and, and that people really do like the characters. I've been really touched by how many people have um, put in an email to me or have, you know, put in a, re in a review on a blog or something or in Kirkus um, or Publishers Weekly that they really like Juliana and Renzo and would really like to read more about them. And I think, you know, that is much more important than, than anything about the, you know, the background, the organic farming, whatever, that, that, that people just have fun. That's, that's what I hope that anybody who gets the book will, will experience is a good time. Yes, I, I agree. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about pesticide as well as the second book that's coming out soon. I really appreciate it. Good. Well, I had a lot of fun and it's always fun to talk about your own work. So that was great. Thanks a lot. Thank you once again to Kim for joining me to talk about Pesticide and a little bit about the next book in the series. I am excited to see what happens to Juliana and Renzo next, where this next case and or cases takes them, and also to see where the series goes and how many books end up actually being in the series. If you are a fan of mystery, especially mysteries set in a different country than where you live, unless you live in Switzerland and then it's not that but that's okay you might still like mysteries but uh, as I said in the interview for me I've read a lot of American mysteries I've read a lot of English mysteries some French mysteries even but um, I think this was the first mystery I've read set in Switzerland so it was really fun for me to just experience a different process and you, you get a lot of some of the same themes that you might be used to but some different procedures than what I was used to personally so I very much enjoyed that part of it. But if you are a fan, then you should definitely check this out. Uh, we're getting closer to Christmas if you're still Christmas shopping. Um, but ebook, audiobook. This is an audiobook, so you know if you're looking for uh, something for the mystery lover in your life, maybe this is something that you want to check out in e version. Because hey, you can get it quickly and you don't have to wrap it. Um, so that might be an incentive. At any rate, you should definitely check it out if it sounds interesting. Also, check out the next episode. This one will be on Friday. We have another Friday episode this week. That episode will be with author David Ellis about his novel, Look Closer. Uh, suspense, psychological thriller, lots and lots of twists and turns. And David's going to talk about some of those twists and turns, but not too many of them because you definitely have to read that book to experience them fully. So join me for that episode. As always, if you are a fan of this podcast, do me some quick favors. Like, follow, subscribe, all those good things so you will get new episodes as soon as they come out. Uh, leave a review on whatever podcast platform you listen to this uh, podcast on. That is extremely helpful. And follow on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I love hearing from you, so come find me. In the meantime, I hope this holiday week is going well for you. Maybe you're spending extra time with family. I hope that is wonderful and enjoyable and just filling you with love and calmness. Um, calmness, especially this time of year. But no matter what's going on this week, um, or any week, of course, you know what my main wish for you is, and that that is that your life will afford you plenty of time to get yourself lost in as many books as you can stand up to. Thank you so much. Talk to you next time. 
You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.